Now, LEDs um, are usually controlled. You, there are some ways of doing it with, with Arduino um, and, and Serial, but we're going to talk about using DMX uh, for LEDs. Um, it's a bit more common um, and a bit more uh, reliable, uh, albeit sometimes more expensive. <laughs> But when you get up to doing uh, many, many LEDs, thousands of LEDs, you really need to go to uh, DMX or Artnet and Artnet and um, or its its newer cousin SACN are both Ethernet based protocols for sending DMX down Ethernet. Um, and so we'll be talking about how do we get all of the data that we want to get um, into this DMX out chop. And this DMX out chop has uh, functions for just regular DMX or ARTNET or SACN here. Um, so basically we need to get uh, everything into CHOPs but CHOP channels are sort of difficult to work with create creatively. They're, they're sort of an abstract you know just a bunch of numbers in an array and uh, it's not very intuitive to control the colors and the shape of them. Um, but you know, touch designer, as you guys are learning, we, we can we can work in 2D image space or 3D world space, and we can use all these tools to help us pre-visualize both our final output and also to make it easier to uh, assign colors and work in a sort of a image-based way. So we're going to go through all that today, and and then show you how to actually address the uh, the DMX out um, devices. So. Sorry. So the, one of the most easiest ways to start with LEDs is getting a 150 uh, pixel LED strip, uh, RGB LED strip. Um, they're super cheap from China, uh, a little bit more expensive from other places, maybe a better quality, but you can get one of these for 20 bucks and, uh, and then get a, a, a LED controller and with touch, you can start mapping LEDs. So um, let's start with sort of visualizing that that LED strip in 3D space. Um, so I'm going to go to our uh, 3D operators, which are SOPs, and look for a line SOP. So this line SOP we can think of as our strip of LEDs. And um, they come in a number of uh, number of LEDs, but very common uh, number is 150 LEDs per strip. Um, and we're going to use this. Um, 150 is actually a pretty good number because um, DMX uh, has a maximum number of channels per universe, and it's 512. So with 150 LEDs, which are R, G, and B, there's three channels of data we need for all three colors. 150 times 3 is 450 channels. So we're using 450 out of the 512. If you get a 300 LED strip, uh, then you have to start breaking up into multiple universes and stuff. It's a little bit more complicated. And actually, Marcus will go through that in, in an hour or so. But we're going to start with just 150 LED strip. So I went to the number of points uh, parameter here and changed it to 150 here. So what that's done is, if I make this viewer active, and turn on the display options, turn on my points, I can see that I have 150 points here, actually. I'll turn on the numbers. So, so we have 150 points here. And each one of these points will represent one of our LEDs. Okay. I'll just leave the points on a bit better. So this can be uh, this can be our strip. Now let's think about um, we want to we're we're going to assign some color or map some pixels onto each one of these LEDs. So in Touch Designer, uh, you know all of our image and 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 pixels are basically handled in tops. So we can use any top here, but let's uh, for ease of starting out, let's start with a ramp top. So it's down in the uh, third column, halfway down. And uh, we can make just a few colors here. Instead of black and white, we can, uh, we can make it a few different colors here. Maybe we'll do a red 
sorry, red, green, blue. I'll put one in the middle. I'll make this white one over here on the far side red. Just giving us these solid colors will allow us to see when the channels are one very easily. Um, so, and let's let's animate this. Let's just uh, have it sort of um, making some motion. Um, it's easier to work, I think, create creatively with an image format as opposed to trying to assign colors to each LED. You know, we can have this this wash of color going through our LEDs, or we could have used black and white. Just we just wanted a white strip. Uh, we could do a circle pattern here and get uh, a circle pattern going through our LEDs. So let's just have a little bit of quick animation. Um, and I'm going to drop down three chops for this: a constant chop, a after this a speed chop, and finally um, a null chop because I'm going to export this value. And I think Elbers used this, uh, this trio of chops earlier, so let's just take the constant and turn it up to some number so it counts forward. But you can see I paused my timeline. Like There we go, so now it's counting forward. And if I select the ramp top, I want to move the, the phase parameter here just to kind of cycle through the ramp colors. Um, so let's export this channel to that, turn uh, the viewer active flag on, grab the channel and export it to face. Select export chop. And we can just control the speed now with our constant. Nothing too fancy yet, but it gives us some animated colors for this. So we need to get these colors, these pixels, these values of color onto these points, these LEDs that we want. We want them to kind of wash through our, our LED strip. So, and in the end, we also need to get all of this data into CHOP so it can go out the DMX out CHOP. So what we want to do is convert both of these forms of data into CHOPs and then work in the CHOP context and then spit it right out the DMX out chop. So let's do, the, um, let's do the line first. Now whenever I change contexts of data, so if I change a SOP into a chop or a top into a chop, I always use it, uh, null uh, first. This is just a nice placeholder to reference from. And it allows me to put extra nodes in here to manipulate the data without having to make new references later on. So I'm just going to add a null SOP here. And then to convert it to chops, it's, uh, it's quite easy. We can just right click on the output of the SOP and go over to the chop page. And it'll show us the two options I have. And SOP to chop is the one I want. So I can pick that, and it'll automatically have it connected for me. Whoops. So I did this a bit yesterday in the <coughs> intro class. If you weren't there, though, what's happening is it's taking, for every single point in this line, I have 150 points, because we set it to 150. It's taking, in the chop here, the position in the TX position, the TY position, and the TZ position of each of those points. There's 150 samples in this chop as well. So it's one-to-one. -one. And I'm getting three channels because it's 3D space. All right. So that's a success. We now have position in chops. So let's do the same with our image. Um, I just want to take, uh, I'm just going to take a strip of pixels across across the image here. So let's add a null top first. And I can use the same trick here. If I uh, cl right click on the output of the null top um, and head over to chops, it will show me you can only use the info chop or the top to chop. So select the top to chop in this case. Now the top to chop is interesting. It, it makes the channel for all the different pixel values. We have red, green, blue, and alpha. Uh, alpha makes no sense for LEDs. It's, it doesn't have an alpha. So let's remove the alpha channel just because it's extra noise. So over here in the alpha parameter, you can just remove the A from there 
and it'll no longer create a channel for that. These parameters basically allow you to name the channels for that for that uh, pixel value. So I could call it alpha or whatever you want, but in this case we're just going to not use it. We just want RGB. And what this is doing is it's taking a a strip uh, uh, of pixels, just just one line, uh, based on the parameters in the crop page. So if you go over to the crop page, you can see I'm going to crop out one row of this image. All right, I'm going to start. So images in texture space have a U for across, same as X, and a V is up and down, same as Y. So it's saying go from U start z position zero, start from here and go to the U end, which is over here. So we're going to go right across the image. And V, since we're only doing one row, there's just one V parameter, and it's saying 0.5. So it's taking the middle one here. If I had it up said zero here, this would take the bottom row. Now, obviously, in this image, it's going to be the same across vertically. Uh, but if, I ha if my ramp like was a, for example, circular like this, taking the middle row is much different than the bottom row. All right, so just if you want to take a different part of your image, this part here uh, allows you to select which row you're taking, okay? I'm just gonna go back to my fancy horizontal ramp. <clears throat> so that's a little bit about this. Uh, you can do other interesting stuff with the top to chop. You can, you can take a vertical column uh, or you can take rows and columns or the full image. We don't need to do that. We're just interested in one strip because uh, we're basically going to take our pixel strip and lay it across the image and get those colors. All right. And this allows you to work in tops and make images. You could throw a movie at it. You can throw uh, text at it. You can do all sorts of stuff. Um, and you'll see that coming across on your LEDs. All right. It's just basically pixel mapping onto an LED. <clears throat> Okay. So, um, so what we want to do is actually um, use this position data. Right now, this is cropping out that that one row that I told you about. What we want to actually use this three D positional data to grab a certain part of the image. And instead of using these parameters here on the crop page, what we can do is if we bring this down and use the input, the top to chop is set up that you'll see these all blank out. And what it's going to do is it's going to place the position of this line onto that image. So um, how, can I, how can I show this a little bit more easily? Um, if I make this a vertical ramp and I'm just going to pause this. You don't need to do this. I'm just going to uh, show you what's happening here. <clears throat> if I now take the line here and transform it up and down in Y, so let me just insert a transform SOP, and I'm going to translate it up and down in Y, you can see my color values are changing. So this red channel is getting higher and higher as I go up the image, and then it's going to snap down to zero and when it hits that, that barrier, there it goes down to zero. So I'm moving this line up in 3D space. It, basically, in between zero and one, I'm moving it up and down the image. So now we can use the 3D space of this, uh, these, these points, to look up into this texture just by connecting it here. You don't have to worry about these parameters anymore. So that's pretty handy. Um, it was designed like that because so many people do this. So um, it's basically a positional lookup into this image. Anyone have a question about that? Does that make sense to people? All right. <clears throat> now, another thing that this top to chop has, um, which is handy on the first image page, is it has an RGBA units uh, and right now, in most things in touch design are, are normalized to 0 and 1. But when uh, DMX, we use DMX, DMX has a range from 0 to 255. The values need to go 0 to 255. And we could use a math shot for this, but it's actually quite convenient here that it already has 
the option for this in the RGBA units. So I can change this here to 0 to 255 and not have to worry about a math shop right now. So, so that's going to get us one step closer to outputting uh, DMX values. <coughs> now, uh, I'll put a DMX out shop down now and just put it way over here. And we have to set this up a, a bit differently than uh, the current default setup. <coughs> First of all, I'm not interested in using this device called the USB Pro, although it works fine. Um, I'm interested in using ArtNet, which is going to send everything down Ethernet. You can go really long distances, and uh, it's just a little bit nicer to work with. Um, so when you change this, uh, this interface to ArtNet, you'll notice the network address becomes available down here. The network address is going to be determined by your ArtNet device that is plugged into your LED. <coughs> so they usually have a configurable uh, configure program where you can set the IP of them unless it's dynamically set, or you can at least uh, inquire the IP and then you put it right in here. So you know it might be something like 10.0.0.1 or whatever, but you have to look at your device on the network and find out which one you're you're accessing. Okay. So let's imagine that that's where my LED device is. We, didn't, we decided not to bring all of our LED equipment because we already were bringing so much equipment <laughs> this, uh, all this way, so we don't have any um, direct example. But uh, so for the format, um, the default here is packet per sample, and what that does is it basically, for every, um, for every DMX channel of the 512, you need a separate chop channel, and the value, as you can see, is just going up and down. It'll go out to DMX like that. But a nicer way to work is uh, changing it to the option of packet per, per channel. And what this does is um, one universe will be one channel. So um, disregard these channels in here right now. We're not going to use them in this format. But we're going to take one universe and fill it with 512 samples. And that will be all the data points for that one universe. And what this allows us to do is do multiple universes in this chop. If I was using this version here, I would need 512 channels for one universe. And if I wanted to do another universe, I would have to copy and paste the DMX out job and do another one and another one, another one, set up the parameters. So not only is it a pain, it, it, it's not as efficient. It's more CPU work to do that. So when you're using multiple universes and uh, ArtNet or S ACN, uh, we always go to packet per channel. Now in this case, we need to do some more uh, massaging of our data here. First of all, we have red going out one universe, green going out another universe, and blue going out another universe, so that's not going to work. We need red, green, and blue all together. Um, and all these, uh, these pixel devices on ArtNet, the way they address the LEDs is the first LED needs uh, red, green, and blue, and then the second LED needs red, green, and blue, and that's the ORT, like, so you need red zero, green zero, blue zero, and then the next piece of data you need is red one, green one, blue one. And right now we have a whole strip of red and a whole strip of green and a whole strip of blue. So we actually need to line them up like red, green, blue, red, green, blue, red, green, blue, and, and kind of package them like that. Because basically when it goes down the LED strip, it's addressing the first LED first, then the second one, then the third one, then the fourth one going right down. So we have a handy chop that'll do that. What we actually want to do is we want to sequence all these, these in order, and it's called the, the shuffle chop. So inside here, in, I'm just going to insert um, a shuffle chop, which is in the second last column at the bottom almost. And to do this, there's a lot of interesting options here. Um, which do all sorts of wild and crazy things. But what we want to do is basically sequence all samples. We want to take all the samples and, and put them in, in order. So now you'll see we have one channel. And instead of uh, three channels of 150, we have one channel of 450. And if I pause this, I might be able to inspect this is a lot of data, but let's just look a little closer at it. 
and I'm going to turn on my dots per sample here in, in this viewer. So here you can see the first, second, and third sample. They correspond to the first red sample, the first green sample, and then the first blue sample. After that, that's for the first LED that we're going to have in our strip. After that, the second LED is going to get the second sample of red, the second sample of green, the second sample of blue in order. So this chalk takes care of all that work for us. I'm just going to home this viewer again with H. Turn off the view. So uh, that's pretty nice. Now the data is in a format we can actually send out DMX and everything's going to work. Um, however, the shuffle job isn't too smart about renaming our channels. You'll see that RGB, it just took the first name. So our channel's named R, and I don't like that. So I'm going to insert a rename chop. And the rename chop simply renames channels. It doesn't do anything that fancy, but um, let's call this universe zero. Can I spell universe today? Yeah. All right. So universe zero will be our first universe. Uh, I call it zero because everything's zero based in touch. So <coughs> so let's go to the DMX out chop. And um, another thing that happened when we changed the uh, packet, the, the format to packet per channel, you'll see packet per sample. And then if I change it to packet per channel, the routing table becomes available. Uh, this parameter is basically giving us this table um, to set up which channel goes to which universe. And in that, uh, in that uh, DMX universe, what's your net and your subnet, um, which are just basically how you address DMX. So let's look in here and open up this little docked node, this docked dat. And you can see this is the routing table it's referring to. DMX out one routing table is right here. So it's docked. If you don't need it, you never know it's there, whatever, but when you need it, it's there and ready for you. So let's uh, specify the channel we want to use as universe zero. Um, and I'll just make this viewer active and right click in this open area and add another row. So the channel name, uh, we just chose universe zero. Of course, you can use any name you want. And the net and the subnet, in this case, uh, we're just going to start out at zero because we don't have to worry about numbering it. We only have one universe in this case. And the universe will also be the first universe, which is zero. So you can see now, if I had a second LED strip, I would just do the same thing, merge it in, and now I would have, I would have two channels up in here. And in this routing table, I'd add another row and call it universe one as my second universe and, and use the proper channel. It also allows you to use the same channel for multiple universes if you want, right? You could say, use universe zero for the first 10 universes and use universe one, channel one for the next 10 universes. Really totally flexible. So that's a nice feature of that. So any question uh, so far about uh, this DMX addressing and, and setting up? Everyone keeping up? OK. Yeah. Um, because the channel we named here, actually, maybe it's confusing to call it that. I could just call it, um, uh, I could call it anything. I could call it, uh, you know, layer, layer zero. And down here, it's just saying, use that channel called layer zero. And here in this universe column, it's saying, uh, address all the things that are hooked up to universe zero. Because downstream, you're going to have to set on your device. Uh, you know, it's gonna, maybe your device has 16 outputs. It'll have universe zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, up to 16. So whatever's connected to universe zero is going to get this data. So yeah, I... It's already there, but it has to be manually. Yeah, because you might have multiple ones in this case. So you have to sort of tell it where to go. It's, it's basically a routing table. So, um, and using the name universe zero and then universe zero, it, it 
makes it easy to read, but maybe a little confusing uh, when it's new. So layer zero is fine, yeah. So um, this is kind of cool, uh, but we don't have LEDs here. And a lot of time when you're installing or creating a show, um, you can't actually get into the space or you won't have the rig created while you're developing. Uh, you might want to pre-visualize things. And Touch Designer you can use to pre-visualize because we have a full 3D engine, right? So since we don't have it here and we want to see how this is going to work and maybe start playing with it, um, let's build a pre-visualizer for our LEDs, all right? And this system is dynamic because we'll be able to go back and if we don't want our LEDs to be in a straight line here, we can change it later. Maybe make it into a, you know, a circle or maybe a, a screen or something like that. But without seeing it, we can't really see the output. So let's make a pre-visualizer. Um, so the first thing I want to do is um, I want to make a little control panel that I can look and inspect my LED strip and look at it from different angles, stuff like that. So if you go to components here, uh, this is uh, the uh, area where we create control panels, is using these components here, panels. And we could use the container to start out and do it all from scratch, but there's a very cool component in the palette that gives us a rotatable camera, so we can kind of inspect things just like you would in a 3D viewer. And it is under the tools section, um, and it's the second one in, called arc ball camera. So go to that, drag and drop it in, and we'll just take a, a quick look at it. If you make the viewer active, you can kind of inspect this with the left mouse button tumble, middle mouse is zoom, and uh, you know pan with the left mouse. And this here is already a container panel, so it's already a UI. So I can right click on it and have it as a floating window, sort of like you know a little a workspace. All right, so this is a nice, easy, fast way to start from the from the palette. And let's rename it from ArcBall Camera to just Preview or LED Preview, whatever you want. And while we're here, why don't we save our file just just in case? So let's go inside the preview component and take a look at what is already there for us. Uh, press home to get it all nicely centered, which is a uh, H key. Um, so there's some stuff here that's that's helpful. Um, I don't want I don't want this uh, this texture, this stuff I don't need. And um, in fact, because these are LEDs and they're going to be self-illuminating, I don't even care about this light here or this fong material. I just want it to self-illuminate no matter what. I don't want to worry about setting up lights and then looking at the wrong side and having shadows and all this stuff. So we can use a different material under mats called the constant material. And it just, it doesn't need a light. It just is bright all the time. So we'll go uh, select the geometry and go to the render page and assign the constant one. You see, now there's no light, but I still have a nice white square. Now, the other thing I want to do is um, I want to have this so I can use it in LED, any LED system that I have. So I want to make some inputs here so I can just kind of connect my uh, 3D geometry and get my colors in there very easily and then reuse it in another place. So let's make some inputs to this component. Inside, we'll add a, a SOP in. This is the in SOP. And a CHOP in. Where is the CHOP in? There it is in the third column. So now if I go back up, you'll see I've added two little inputs here. So that's handy. Um, so what we can do is quite simply just take our line, our geometry, 
and we'll plug it into the SOP input. And let's take our colors here from the top two before we shuffle them because we want the red, green, and blue and, and plug it in here. So I'm getting all my information into the previewer now. Now, there's one thing we need to do here. I, I know that something is going to screw up later down the road, so I'm just looking ahead. Because we set this up to use uh, 0 to 255 RGBA units for the DMX out, when I plug it in here and use it inside touch for rendering, those units are crazy. It, it wants 0 to 1. <coughs> so I could do that out here, or I could do that inside. Um, I'm just going to do it here. I'm going to insert a math operator, a math chop. And I'm just going to sort of undo the 0 to 255 here. Um, so instead of 0 to 1, let's make it 0 to 255. So it's going to take the numbers from 0 to 255 and make them back into 0 to 1. This is just data massaging so that we can use it properly for lighting inside. Because a 0 to 255 would have meant everything is white all the time. And there's no, not too much difference uh, putting this inside. Um, yeah, it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. The top? This one? Yeah, I stay at, okay. These ones stay at, two, yeah, um, because we set it here. And then this math is a new branch, so it's going to be 0 to 1. Uh, whereas, you know, this going out to the DMX devices is still the nice high 255 range so that we need there. Yeah. So we're re reusing data and manipulating it in two different branches. You know, actually, maybe if you're going to reuse this in many places and you're always going to take your 255 values, you'd put this on the inside, but um, I'm going to do it on the outside in this case. So Let's go inside now. Um, now, yesterday, in, for those who took the intro course, we didn't have a time to talk about instancing, um, but we're going to be able to do some instancing here. Um, so... Instancing is basically taking geometry and making a copy of it on the GPU. So it's very, very fast. If we try to make 150, uh, let's, we're going to try to make a little piece of geometry that's going to be an LED. And if we copied 150 um, of these in SOPs, it's going to be a little bit heavy when they're moving around or animating. Uh, maybe 150 your machine can handle, but if you're trying to pre-visualize 4,000, you're not going to have any frame rate left, right? So we're going to use GPU instancing to, to copy this geometry, whatever's in this geo, to every single point on this line. All right, so we're going to make tiny little LEDs that we can light up. So I'm going to change this box. I guess we could have a square LED, right? I'm going to change it to a sphere anyway. I want, I want little round LEDs. So I'm going to use a sphere SOP. And I'm going to plug it into this. And I know from experience, uh, we, we could find out through errors later, but I know from experience that a radius of 1 is going to be uh, way too big for these LEDs, especially since my line only goes from 0 to 1. So if I copy a sphere that is 1 in diameter to this, uh, it's just going to be on top of each other. So let's make the radius really tiny, um, maybe 0 0.005 in all... All axis. There we go. We have a tiny little LED. Um, so if I look at the geometry component, uh, for those are, that are, haven't done instancing or are new to it, there are two pages for instancing. Um, basically because a long time ago when we made this, we didn't have a scroll bar on here. So <laughs> but um, for instancing, if I turn on instancing, um, you can see it is asking here for a chop or a dat. It's saying, give me the data I need for every one of these copies uh, in the form of a, a chop or a dat. 
So the first thing we want to do is we want to position these, these little LED spheres all along our line here. So we need to convert this line into chops, which we did just outside again, but uh, let's do it again here. And we're going to go to chops and say SOP2. And we get that familiar TX, TY, TZ, which is all the positions of these points. Okay. So I'm going to add um, a null chop to this because I always do that. Maybe I'll just move this down a little bit like that. And then go to the geometry component and I can drag this null chop I added, sorry, over to the instance chop parameter. You could also type in null one or whatever you want to do, but I like drag and drop. And as soon as you specify something here, it's going to open up all these parameters for you. So it's going to say, which channel, which channel in this shop do you want to use for the TX information? And which one for the TY? Now, if I wanted to rotate all these things or scale them, I can also supply rotation channels, scaling channels, pivot channels. But for now, we have TX, TY, and TZ positional data ready. So let's just um, type this in, TX for TX. You can also use on the right hand side this drop down menu and it, it'll show you, I don't know if you can see that over there, yeah. It'll show you all the uh, channels available. So I could select TY and then for T, TZ, TZ. So let's look at this a little bit and see if we have some instancing. Um, I'm gonna make my viewer active and just zoom in a little to see what's going on. Hey, I do have, look at that, I have LEDs there, or a whole bunch of spheres. And they're actually so big, they're still on top of each other. They're huge LEDs. So um, I'm going to select the, the sphere that's going in there, and I'm going to make it even tinier. I'm going to make it 2.2 2 and point, point 0.002. Okay. Now they have some space. It's a pretty, um, it's a pretty dense LED strip we bought. So uh, one thing I'm, uh, that's happening here um, is our input line is starting at uh, uh, an X position of zero and going to an X position of one. So you can see that's exactly where our instances are. But for a previewer, it's kind of annoying that I have to go and look in space wherever this thing is to kind of just preview it. I always want it to be in the center because I'm just previewing an object. I don't care where it is in world space. Um, so I actually would like to kind of fix this, kind of shift it so it's always on the origin at 000. That way when I home, it's always in the middle, you know, and it's just easier to work with. So we can kind of uh, massage the position of this um, so that happens. So over here, um, I'm going to add uh, a transform SOP. Transform SOP? Yeah, transform SOP. And I could manually move it over to the uh, origin, but if I did that, everything that comes in, you'd have to do it manually. So I'm going to go to the post page and select for post translate X. I'm going to say origin, and I'm going to do the same for Y and Z. So it's just going to shift everything to the origin. It's kind of handy. Now you see what happened here. I broke my own number one rule. I didn't use a null SOP when I converted into a chop. So now I, I have th no data changing actually. So I kind of screwed up and that just is a really good example of why you always use a null operator to make a reference. Because now that I want to change my data, I have to go back and fix all this. So we'll add a null SOP and do it properly. And I'll select this, uh, this SOP too and, and make the null SOP be referenced. It's much better. I also like just personally moving the ones that are referencing each other sort of above each other. So when I'm reading my network, I go along and it's like, this null SOP is going into this chop. I can see that it's changing there. Um, so I just kind of move things around to do that. OK, and now we can see over here our LEDs are centered around the origin. So when I go up a level, and I, I look at this preview. 
if I zoom in, it's nicely centered around the center here. So that's just it's just going to be more helpful later when we start in inspecting it. So back inside. So we have the position and we have the colors down here and the colors line up uh, 150 points and 150 samples of color because they came from the same thing on the outside. So all I have to do is merge these colors in and then I can kind of assign the colors to the instances as well. So uh, there is a merge chop for merging chops. So let's go to the uh, insert operator by right clicking on that wire and select merge. And I'm just gonna plug in my colors like that. And we'll see I have six channels now. The colors are added to the bottom. Now, no colors are actually set up yet because we haven't told the geometry instant. Yep. Pardon? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> this was the input coming from the outside, this, these colors here. Is everyone uh, okay or any questions? Mm -hmm. It's basically centering everything. Yeah. It's, it, this is a post, tr like uh, this page here, you can move stuff first. And this post is sort of like after you've moved it, it, you can do something else to it. And it has this very convenient take me to the origin. Or you can a reference input, uh, which is this second input here. So you could, if you had another geometry in, world, in some space, you could put it into this input and select reference input. Um, so it basically shifts stuff around for you. It's just a handy feature. So it, it, it's, uh, it, it, let's say in the, if in the transform, um, you move the positions around, what, what would happen? On the outside? No, in the, in the transform shop, in the left. Yeah, okay, I so if I move this, it, it won't do anything because this, it's this is post. So post is like having, happening after the next step. Yeah. So, but it's only translate. So I could still, I could still scale it, for example, and then it would tr translate it. The scale is down here. The features for scale. So, it's not an often used feature, but if for this, uh, for previewing something and snapping it to the middle, it's really handy. Yeah. It doesn't matter how big your object is or where it is. It could be way over here. It's just going to snap it down to the origin. So let's assign these colors over here to our um, our instanced LEDs. So I'm going to select the geometry component, and um, that's why we have an instance two page for a bunch of extra stuff. Uh, and if you go to the instance two page, you'll see down at the bottom there's these color uh, options. So we can do the same thing: just assign uh, the red channel to the red color, the green channel to the green color, the blue channel to the blue color. And you can see our instances are getting colors right away. So that's good. So uh, let's go up a level and um, just take a look at this. I'm going to open this uh, as a floating viewer. So right click on it and, and view so you can see it nicely. And maybe if I pause this with a red somewhere in the middle, we can inspect it. And you can see we have our blue over here uh, on the left side, which is corresponding to this first LED, and it sweeps through to red, green, and then blue. So this is just a preview, an exact preview of what we're going to be sending out the DMX so you can get an idea of how it looks, right? How did you open it? Sorry, I, I right-click on the uh, component and select View. And you can do this with any operator. So if you wanted a floating uh, window of this chop so you could work with it, you can also have a floating chop viewer. And whoops, sorry. It's slightly harder to resize, apparently. And you could do this and keep it up here if you're navigating elsewhere and stuff. So any viewer, you can do that too. So right click, view. And then uh, tumbling is left mouse button. And moving around is pan. And when, if you get lost like this, you can still press H to home it. The home is a bit far away there, but whatever. Excuse me, could you show me the 
show me the geo or something? Just if you select. Inside, you mean the geo component? Um, yeah. I mean, how would you do that? The <coughs> color used to be visible. Uh, color mode. Yeah, a color mode I left as replaced. That is the default. And then I set R, the R channel to be. <coughs> sorry, this is saying what what yeah. color do we want for red? But I did this and I don't have the colors. Can you take a look, Marcus? Um, you have red, green, and blue here coming in. Did you to merge your red, green, and blue together? Yeah. So this is a really basic instancing example, but you can start playing with this example and building all sorts of other stuff or put different geometry in. If we didn't want this, these round spheres, I could have put that box back in, that box, and it's super huge and make it really tiny. Maybe it's easier to type this in here. And now if I look at it, I have little square LED cubes. If you had a model of your LEDs and you were you wanted to make it look exactly like, you could plug in the model here and you'd have little LED models. <coughs> All right? So you can instance any geometry and super fast in the GPU. This is only 150, but you could do like 5,000 here and it wouldn't it wouldn't blink. So um, yeah, it's a good feature. I'm gonna go back to the sphere so we're all on the same page. No matter what you put there, like it's gonna output, uh, it's gonna show the, the, the light, the color is gonna show the same way, right? Like the color will be, yeah. It's the whole object will be colored though. You you can't like put m little textures on your object. It's the whole color, yeah. So, um, I mean, You could probably do donuts as well. Like you just have to make them really tiny. So anything you want. <clears throat> so this is basically the the default setup you're going to use for starting to map LEDs and taking these pixels from any image and and doing something with them. So we can change this image. Like let's just go to the I think it's a circular ramp. And I'm going to open this again. And now you can see that we have this circular thing going on. Now, right now, because my line is, is where is my line? I got to check my line. My line's at point 0.1. So if my line is at 0y, it's at the bottom of this image. You can see that if we pause it, just a little bit of green and blue on the ends. If I wanted to put it up to the middle of this image, I need to translate this line to 0 0.5 and Y. Now you'll see we're getting a little bit of green, red, a little bit of green in the center, red, and then a little bit of green at the end. So the line here, I inserted a transform stop and just move it up and down in Y in between 0 and 1 to determine where you're sampling your image from. And what's nice about this system is you can just try a whole bunch of ideas really quickly. I mean, I could just grab another ramp here really fast and dirty here and just go vertical like this and plug it in. It's going to be sort of white right now. And if I also export the same channel to, to move it, we're just going to have it fade up and snap in and fade down, snap in and fade down, because it's just cycling through that. So you can see how it's really easy and visual to work with, as opposed to working with a bunch of numbers and encoding it. So Now more interestingly is like, what if we have, putting our line out straight is sort of, uh, you might have to do it in a lot of installations, but it's, it's something we, we can do something different with. So let's maybe... Lay, if we lay out our LED strip in a circle, what's going to happen? Right? <coughs> so to do that, we just have to change our input geometry. So I'm going to create a circle stop here, circle. 
and I need this circle sop to have 150 LEDs because I'm going to take my LED strip and wrap it around some ball or something. So I go to the divisions parameter and change it to 150. And the arc type, I'm going to uh, say open arc. So it's just, it's just a round circle like this that's open. And if I turn on the display options, I can see all my points. That's 150 points on this guy. Yep. Now one thing about this is I need it to be between 0 and 1 in space and this, this circle is actually bigger than the line. The circle has a radius of 1, so that means it's radius of 1. So I need to actually make it a little smaller. So I'm going to make the circle maybe 0.5 in size so it fits in 0 and 1. And then just plug it in. Let's just see. Oh, and I'm going to remove that translation I have in Y so it's... So it's centered. And you can see now that our ramp is sort of mapping through the circle. It's very visual. It's one to one. You can kind of get it an instant idea. Or I could uh, go back to this circular ramp here, and you can see the colors going through your circle in a totally different way. Yeah. Which way? Sorry. That's right. Okay, I'm. I'm. That's right. I, I noticed the color was a little odd uh, off here. Um, I need to be in z zero to one, as I said, because this this is zero to one here in this image, and right now this is centered on zero. You see that this is in negative territory. So um, we just translate this over 0 0.5. 0 0.5. So I had scaled it, but I forgot to shift it over, and then also push it up 0.5. So now you can see that your circle is, is in the zero to one space. And that makes more sense because as this color is coming out, it's getting into the circle. Um, so the circular ramp isn't the best example of this, maybe horizontal again. Now you can see the color sweeping through your circle perfectly. <coughs> Um, you you can you can do that. Um, I, uh, so you can do that in SOPS in the 3D world. Uh, touch designer is unitless, so you can choose whatever units you want to work in inches, meters, kilometers, mm -hmm. whatever, as long as you're consistent. Mm -hmm. But the the trick about this is uh, when you're when you're um, using a position onto this image and looking up this image, you then have to normalize everything to zero and one. So you can, you can do that in chops, but sometimes it's a little easier to conceptualize in, in the 3D world as well. So, um, because if you go past this and you're saying it's at, it's five meters long, it doesn't, you don't know where that five is out on the image. Okay. Um, so here's a circle, but we could also do, let's make a grid and think about it more like a LED panel. Uh, you know, just a, a, a grid of panels. Now, we still have to consider uh, having 150 points, so the default grid is, is too much. Um, so let's make it 12 by 12. That's 144 points. Yeah, it's pretty close. We're, we're not going to go over our one universe limit in this example. And I can plug, I can plug this in. Actually, I'm going to go inside my previewer, and now I'm going to make my spheres a bit bigger because I don't know why they're just hard to see. There we go. It's all custom, so you can do whatever you want, right? I mean, it's very uh, fun to visualize and work with here. So I have my ramp going through my image here. Um, you can also load in any image you want with a movie in top, right? So I have a movie in top. I can put the banana in. Right, or you can you can load a movie in here, a full movie. Um, let's just go to, whoops. Oh, where's all my files? <coughs> mm. Thank you. 
Um, Yeah, the rectangle only has the four points on the corners. It's a super lightweight one. Um, sorry, I just had to find my files, which are not on this computer. So, so I'm just going to grab a movie from yesterday. Uh, you can use any movie on your system. That's not a great one. I wanted something with a little more color. OK. So it's a low res, uh, it's a low res one universe LED grid, but I mean, it's cool. You can fire a movie through it. You could fire a webcam through it. You can do whatever you want that's in tops. Um, and this is a bit low res, but the system we've built, the, we have to stay under this for one universe, but the system we built is completely dynamic. So um, if you manage your universes downstream, which is what uh, Marcus can, can show us how to do, you could make this, this high res. Um, 40 and 40, and it, the system works, the previewer works, everything works. The only thing that won't work is you can't send that many LEDs out one channel. See, it says, uh, sorry, you only got five channels per universe, I mean, 512 channels per universe, so you're, you're doing something wrong. So, so um, this previewer is pretty handy. Uh, you can kind of visualize your ideas beforehand and, uh, and get an idea of that. So any questions? I've run over and I, uh, I've only given Marcus uh, 45 minutes, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. What if I had that grid made with a single line of television like that? Um, so what you need to do is you need to make your geometry so that it is ordered that way. So if I look closely at this geometry, if I look closely at this geometry and I'll put it in wireframe mode and say display options as numbers. And then I, I look, where's zero, zero? Is it down here? You see these numbers here? It's, maybe I'll knock down this number so it's a little easier, 20, 20. It's zero to one and then the next row is 20 to 40 and then the next row is, so what you need to do is make your topology so it's zero to 20 and then the next one, 21, is up, and then 21 to 40, and then 41 to, the, and we did this in our 3D mapping I can do that course, so he's actually going to show uh, how to do this, because we did a 3D uh, LED cube, and we ran them like that. We wired them like that, so, because it was much easier. And so we just have to make the geometry point numbers match up, <coughs> and it just auto-magically works. So. Um, any other questions? You can save that file if you want to check it out later. Um, I also can give you this file uh, in its completeness if you if you want uh, later. Um, but maybe everyone kept up anyway, so I don't know. Okay, I'll hand it over to Marcus. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Damn it. Oh, it's the movie. I have to stop the movie. Sorry. Um, not monochrome. Ben has told me over and over again to use a trackball, and so this is the first time <laughs> I'll do that. Do you want to know? No, it's fine. You sure? Yeah, I'm learning. <laughs> Quick learner. I can find a mouse for you. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, so, I think that's okay now. Let's just take my USB stick and. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn how to use this. Alvers was all, also full of praise. So, um, thing is, I don't walk, ar walk around in the office much or in spaces. So, 
Um, anyway, so we have this grid, and maybe I'll mention that right away. Yes, it is often that you don't know how the wiring is going to be in your LED mo um, in your LED setup, and uh, I mean, for a grid, just technically, it makes more sense to um, splice power through like this, as far as the power source takes you, before then starting again. So, yes, the grid as it comes, the grid sub might not be the best um, the best way to create actually a grid. What is very useful to use is just a single line with the 150 um, LEDs on it or points on it and then use a copy sub and the copy sub is a great uh, all around uh, sub that everybody should always be using for uh, fun and giggles um, and it lets you create <coughs> copies of your let me just put this right into the transform here so we can see what we're doing. Um, um, it's the middle mouse button, yes. Oh, and I've got the transform in here, which I don't need for this home. Or do I need it? Sorry. No? Where are we? We might have to zoom in. Oh. This is just a banana texture. I'm lost. We'll find it again eventually. Here it is. Uh, da, 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 da. Translate zero. Okay. And there is a post actually. Oh, it's the uh, it's the it's looking up into the banana where there is no banana. Makes sense. I'll leave it like this for now, or choose a different image than the banana yeah. that makes more sense. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> That's when the banana can confuse you. <laughs> anyway, so we have this copy sub here, and uh, the first parameter that you have um, for that you can use is the number of copies. And let's say we have 150 LEDs, and we'll have um, a magical amount of 10 rows of these LEDs. So I'll set the number of copies to 10. Uh, we right away see what we're getting is. Uh, 4,000, sorry, this makes it uh, 1,500 um, LEDs in total. And now the copy sub has this translate parameter or the translate parameters, which uh, translates each copy um, cumul uh, cumulatively. So by increasing the TY, I can, I can move them apart like this. And now if I inspect this whole thing, as Ben has shown, we still will see that the point numbers are um, nope. bear with me, I'm learning, but this is good. <coughs> good. So uh, we still have this uh, the points lined up 0, 1, 2, 3 here, and then 150, whatever. So what we can do is, <coughs> when you scale each copy um, uh, uh, over the x-axis, what you're actually doing is you're flipping the direction. Like, uh, sorry, scale by minus 1, you're flipping the, uh, um, the direction of the uh, point order. So now you see it starts here with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, the first one. And the next one here, because now it's going the other direction, is 150 at the end of it. So what I need to do is I need to move this into the, the initial line that we had. We'll just move into a, a normalized space of minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. Now, if I look at this here, oh, okay, I've got 0, 1, 2, 3, and the next one is 229, 298, 297, indicating that now my rows, and my points are going like that. And I have to enable again this transform, which moves it back into my uh, first quadrant, uh, 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, okay so that I have unit space here. And the question came, yes, what happens if you have an oval or something like this? Um, 
uh, currently what I would uh, what I would do is there is there is the feature or well, actually, the easiest way to do it is uh, by using a Python expression where you can look at the maximum uh, dimensions in X, Y, and Z. And so you can figure out the aspect ratio of your, um, of your original and then do a, then I usually do a post, uh, scale it into a unit, mm -hmm. and then scale it again to the uh, uh, to, to, to aspect ratio. And uh, yeah. It's a it's a static process, and you can build this into your setup as one a component. So anything you put into this will have a unit uh, measurement for getting at the texture, mm. but will always be displayed in the correct uh, aspect ratio. Um, I'll skip this because it's late, but that's basically. Uh, if you if you're looking for all these Python commands that you have available in SOPS, all parameters have the um, um, help pages up here, the regular help and the Python help, and the Python help will tell you um, its members that are available for these nodes. And you see here that you have a min max, which is the minimum coordinates and the maximum coordinates for the oh even size. So. Um, okay, so now we have this massive amount of um, uh, LEDs or color values that we need to uh, somehow send over to DMX. And again, per channel, what you have available is 512 values and we need to package this up. Um, <coughs> Often what happens is that you would say just for ease of connecting, let's say um, we're using, for example, this device called an Advatec Pixlite. I'm not sure if you guys are uh, familiar with it. Advatec Pixlite, which is um, it's not very expensive considering. Uh, yeah, it's about... 330 uh, euros, but you can control up to, and I might be off by a thousand, it's like up to 15,000 or 16,000 LEDs. So for the price, it's quite, quite a number of LEDs and a wide range of LEDs as well. Um, and you have 16 inputs to it. Per input, you can send multiple universes. Still, what you have to do in Touch Designer um, you still have to send each universe as its own channel because internally how the protocol works, um, it needs to be packaged that way. Um, so let's have a look here. We have uh, 4,500 values now. We want to send one LED strip out to one universe. And often the way I deal with this now is that I look at the pattern shop. The pattern shop is a really nice, uh, fairly recent addition. I don't even know how recent it is. Uh, it's very close to the wave shop uh, that a lot of you might have worked with, but it's a little bit simpler because it just has a length parameter which is missing in the uh, wave shop. And the length parameter, you can set the total length of the channel. So I need 450 samples, done. Um, if you remember in the wave chop, it's more complicated to set the lengths to this of the channel because <coughs> you have a um, start end reference for each channel that determines the length. So um, having this as one parameter is really great. Um, and we can set this to something called uh, ramp samples, which means that you have a ramp that's created that counts from zero to its lengths in integers. So zero to 449, all integer values. And this creates a great lookup. This sounds like a great lookup table where you can, um, for each sample now, you can actually look into, uh, like I wanna have the first sample of this to the 450th sample and uh, have them on this 
create a lookup table that takes this ramp that goes from 0 to 449 and grabs the corresponding samples out of this long table here, out of this long uh, channel here. So to do this, we need a lookup chop. And so in the output of the pattern, I will add a lookup chop. And the lookup chop takes as the first input the uh, index and as the second input the lookup table, which would be all my values here. Okay. This works great. It doesn't do anything that we want to do, but this is because of my index range. So, um, again, what does the lookup do? You give it indice indices in the first um, in the first input, and then it takes the second input and tries to fetch the values at the uh, at its indices that you're giving. Um, <laughs> The index range is set by default to 0 and 1, meaning my value 0 in my, um, in my index chop will be the start of the channel, while a value of 1 in my first input will be the end of the channel that I'm adding into the second input. And obviously this is not going to work well because my indices are integers from 0 to 4, <coughs> uh, 45. So what my total index range should be, it should be the length of the second input here. And I can set that and I'll use a little Python expression. So to add a little Python expression here, click on the index range on the name of the parameter and then it opens these two um, little bigger parameter fields. And we can just type in an expression which would be, we want to look at the, you can just follow me along here if you're, um, if all these Python things are fairly new, but it would be me, which is the lookup chop dot um, inputs. And I've got two inputs and this is, so this is a list basically of inputs. My second input has the index of one because we're always zero based. And then dot num samples, I think. Sometimes it's length, but I think it's num samples. And finally, because it's from zero to the length and not one to the length, we have to do minus one. And I have my index range. So now the lookup chop accepts inputs with indexes from zero to 4,499. This means with, I give it a channel that goes from 0 to 449, it will grab the first 450 samples of the second input. Does that make sense? <laughs> Sorry? Yes. Um, Maybe I'll maybe I'll use a channel that uh, that looks better, that's a little bit easier to. Uh, let's take a wave chop as the second input, and I'll make the uh, um, I'll set it up like this, and we'll take a pattern with a ramp, just a regular ramp, which goes from zero to one, and I'll use this as my lookup table. My, I use the first, the first pattern input as my indices into the lookup table. And because it goes from 0 to 1, it returns the whole, um, it returns the whole waveform here. So now, if this doesn't, if my indices don't go from 0 to 1, but, so I'll change the amplitude here, but to 0 to uh, 0 to 0 0.5 or something like this in this area. I'm only grabbing the first half of the of this whole thing. Now if I offset it by a little bit, now I start grabbing not the first half, but I'm sliding basically the window that I'm looking at to grab this half now because my index range now is from 0 0.4 something to 1 
or something in that area, right? So the lookup, it's a lookup table, basically. You have indices, and you use these indices to look into the second channel and grab the values uh, for those indices. Can you show again the expression, please? Um, and the expression that I have used for, this, is, this was now on the example where I'm dealing with a zero to one ramp, but if I want to deal with uh, proper integer values, then um, I'm choosing to uh, uh, set the index range to uh, this little expression here, which is me.inputs1, which gives me the second input of this lookup job, dot num samples, which gives me the total number of samples in the second uh, input, and minus one because zero to four four nine nine makes four thousand five hundred samples. Um, what I'm getting here now, if I look, so my input to the lookup job has 4,500 samples. The lookup job itself, again, has 450 samples. Because my first input, the pattern that I created, is a ramp with 450 samples. A length of 450 that I set. So this is one universe here. This is, again, one universe that I can feed into the... Uh, um, into the DMX out job. Now, I don't want to just have one universe, but I have those 10 universes. So I need to create multiple of these index channels. I want to have 10 of them. And I can do this on the channel page here by saying uh, channel. And uh, if you want to create many channels at once, you can use these... Uh, um, this pattern matching by putting square brackets after the channel name and then 1 to 10 inside the square brackets will actually create 10 channels. So it's channel open square bracket 1 to 10. Yes? So if we write 0 to 9, will it have the absolute same effect or would the fact that there is 10 lines you can do 0 to 9 as well. That's the same, yeah. I wonder if you can do minus 1 to 2. <laughs> I've never tried that. <laughs> um, it might complain about that. But, uh, yeah, so you can uh, choose any numbering or naming that you like, as long as it's 10 channels. And now the next step would be that the lookup job itself oh by default only it takes one index channel. We have to actually change a parameter here, which is the uh, um, per index channel, one lookup table channel. And what we want to do is per index channel, all lookup table channels. So the per index channel of the lookup chop <coughs> needs to change from one lookup table channel to all lookup table channels. So now I'm creating 10 outputs there. 10 universes, and they all look the same because my index range for all of my channels currently is 0 to 449. The, the which, sorry? Uh, pattern? pattern? Yeah, um, I just changed on the channel page the channel names to, uh, it said chen1 initially, and <coughs> that now it says chen open square bracket 1 dash 10 close square bracket. Use your backup. Okay. So the last thing we have to do here to send all these across in the right, to pick the right uh, universes here, is that we have to offset each channel copy by 450 samples, right? Or by the value of 450, so that the first channel goes from 0 to 449. The next one goes from 450 to uh, um, 899. And we can use a little expression for that. That should actually probably be a parameter. I'd like that. Yeah, That would be easier. Um, and the, uh, um, the expression for this would be me dot chen index. 
So this basically gives me the, I think it's meter chain index. We'll see. Um, times 450. So meter chain index would be the number of the channel that's currently being processed <coughs> times the 450. And if we look at the, uh, if we look at now the channels that are being created, we see that the values are um, for the first channel 0 to 449, second 450 to 899, and so on. So this together gives us gives us um, uh, our 10 universes. Now, there's a simpler way to do this, but I didn't mention the simpler way because the simpler way has uh, a drawback. The simpler way to split up a shuffled chop with lots of samples into multiple channels with the same number of channels would be to use another shuffle and uh, I'll just add it here just to show you because maybe um, when you're doing um, it's good to know for quick quick things if you don't want to deal with um, indices and whatever and the shuffle has this option where you can say split and now I never know. It's either split N samples. I think it's N samples, yes. So you can say uh, the shuffle method split N samples. And then it splits. It takes, by default, it's set, the N value is set to 3. So it creates um, 1,500 channels with 3 samples each. What we want is 10 channels with 450 samples each, so my n value would be 450. And I basically have created the same, the same thing. Now the drawback is that in a lot of LED installations that you might find out there, people are not so nice to always give you the same number of LEDs per universe. Sometimes they're saying, oh, we want to maximize our universes because we have so many. So we're going to fill the first universe, which only takes you to a calculator. This takes you to the calculator, which is the constant chop. And you type in 512 divided by 3. So you get 170 LEDs. And 170, OK, calculator. 170 times 3 for each color. That's 510 uh, values for the universe. And then you have two values left there, which you cannot fill with anything, really. So it's something left over. So you start getting uneven. Uh, sometimes you start getting uneven distributions of universes. Your first universe might be filled to 510. Your second universe might be filled to 450, etc., and so on. And that means that you have to create these index channels. You cannot just split in equal parts. You have to create these index channels to reflect how your LEDs are distributed over um, all these universes. Meaning, um, what I then often do uh, concerning the time, I will not do this now, um, I take a table where somebody tells me what the start and the, or what the length for each universe is, how many uh, samples. And then I, um, my offset, for example, I would always set the length to uh, uh, 512, for example, and then look at the, uh, my offset per channel would be pulled out of this table. I can always send more values per universe than the universe uses because any DMX device that you have attached to Artnet device is just going to throw it away. It doesn't care. If there's nothing attached to it, then it doesn't care anyway. Um, now, and this brings me to the routing table here with my 10 channels. And I would have to fill in this routing table either, one by one. Um, the other option, if, the, if you have if you have um, a DMX set up where all universes are used in sequence, then what you can do is actually remove the routing table and you just give it the start universe. So you say net zero, <coughs> subnet zero, universe zero. And now what it's going to do, it takes each channel and just puts it into the next universe. 
and if the net, the, if the subnet is full, you have 16 universes per subnet. If the subnet is full, it's going to take the, go to the next subnet and fill it up. So if you have sequential um, DMX setup, then you can delete the routing table. You don't have to fill it in and just uh, give it the start universe. Um, but often enough, what you have is that it's not sequential. And often enough, it is that you don't just have one DMX device or one ArtNet device or whatever. You have many of those devices. And that's when you actually want to add another column, which is called net address. And now the net address, what you can do, is that spelled right now? In the net address column, now you can specify for each channel, not just the universe, but also the IP address. So from this point on, if you have lots and lots of ArtNet devices out there, you can specify for each channel that you output also the IP address, meaning um, theoretically all your DMX communication could go out of one single DMX out shop, which lowers the load quite dramatically um, if you have full, if you have a large setup, then um, one of these taking up to 0 0.1 milliseconds, if you need to send to 16 of the, or 20 or whatever DMX devices, you would theoretically um, end up with a considerable amount of cook time here. <coughs> but being able to specify everything in one operator um, really optimizes your installation here. So net address can be specified per channel, you can give it an IP address. Um, the, uh, I think that's all what I wanted to say about the, um, any questions? Would you have to rename the layers to chance, uh, how would you name the layers for multiple? Correct, um, I was, I was, um, I was being very lazy here, and I didn't do that, and it wouldn't work right now. And since we don't have LEDs, I don't realize that it doesn't work, um, which is bad when you when you don't have LEDs at home and you do something for a customer, and then you're like, here you go, nothing happens. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you, what you would want to do is rename them proper. Um, you can uh, just add a rename here if you want to name them properly, or. Um, so the rename shop lets you rename in a nice way or the other thing is just change the name in the uh, um, routing table to uh, chain one layer zero and so on chain one layer zero it's actually funny it should complain that it cannot find the channel but it doesn't so um, or again, you delete the routing table, then you don't need the naming at all for sequential setups. And that would just be 111 on that, so that universe? Oh, for the next channel? Yeah. yeah, so for the next channel, it would be um, <coughs> chen1 layer 1, and then probably yeah, 0, 0, 0, 0, 001. 0, 0, 1. Um, so the thing is, per uh, DMX is defined that you have uh, 16 universes per subnet. Then you can have 16 subnets per net. And then you can have a total of 128 nets, at which point already probably your network is collapsing. Is the name but Chan 1 layer 1 or <coughs> Chan 2 layer 0? Oh, sorry. You're correct. Chan 2 layer 0. Yes, because it's determined by my uh, lookup, by the index channels, yeah. There. Yep. This is, by the way, also um, the default network address for the ArtNet device is set to 255, 255, 255, blah, blah, which basically means it's broadcasting. Uh, if you're dealing with large setups, this can cause trouble in your network as well. So it's always advisable to uh, um, speak to a specific IP. Um, otherwise, uh, we do support under um, 
SACN, we do support multicasting, which then would be the most efficient way to distribute in a network your data without um, um, killing your network performance, like the LAN network performance. Um, I wanted to mention one more thing. The, uh, uh, you often have the case that your uh, LEDs are not in the order RGB. They can be uh, um, GBR or whatever. Uh, <coughs> G, I don't know, any order that they think it makes sense to wire them up. And um, so there's two options to deal with that. One option would be that you take um, there's the reorder, there's the reorder um, chop to um, fix this, or yeah, you still would use the reorder chop. I sometimes just name them not RGB. I name them like B. A C or something like this and then I use the reorder chop to <coughs> um, base name sort and then I get A B C again and then I that's an easy way for me to reorder them Other, yeah After, yeah. So, how do you add in a channel that you You would add this in here because uh, you want to have the RGB in sequence and then maybe uh, uh, two, two channels where nothing happens. Mm -hmm. So, what I would do is I would create, uh, or let's take a pattern. Pattern shop here. Now the pattern shop can take an input as well, which is uh, mostly used just for length reference. So you don't have to specify the length. That means it's independent from any uh, geometry that you're giving you, it will scale. And I would set that to constant and create uh, as many channels as I, as I have dead samples there. So let's say I have five dead values in between. And then I merge this before giving it into the shuffle. And now if I look at the shuffle, all oh right, I can just do this. Oh no, I can't, that's too bad. Sorry, I'm just discovering trackpad, uh, trackball uh, <laughs> things. Um, so what I now created is that, right? I can splice in in regular ways that values. Um, and still grab 450 per, which probably wouldn't make much, but yeah, that's fixable. Um, we did reordering, we did this, we did that. We're sending many channels out. So, uh, if you like, for the last minute, or if you have five more minutes, um, I'll just show you a file which is also available on the, uh, uh, it's on the internet, you can download it. But it's something that came out of a workshop that we did um, last September or something like this, where we built an LED cube and, uh, and this LED cube, is it this one? So what we built at the office is a cube that has 10 by 10 by 10, um, has a resolution of 10 by 10 by 10 pixels. Um, we do have a video somewhere, but I'm not sure where. Um, the problem of that is that you're not dealing just with, you're not dealing anymore just with a plain um, UV lookup into a single texture. 
But now what you kind of want to do is you want to look into a volume. And um, what's missing is we don't have a voxel renderer or something. But I do have here the trusted preview, which is pretty much the same preview that, um, that Ben built with you. And you can see that I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm basically shooting particles through a, I can show you the, um, I should be looking here. So it's a, it's a little particle system that just shoots random particles through space. And those are then rendered onto the cube. Um, and the cube is then showing this. Uh, I just mentioned the trails that you see here, <coughs> the trails that are being created. Those are actually done in chops by using so you see here, those are the RGBA values from all the, um, for all the LEDs. But then I'm using a lag, and the lag has the option to lag per sample. So you can now per sample uh, filter the uh, movement, which gives you the trail here. There's no up lag, but a long uh, slope down. Um, and now it's getting interesting. Here I have my cube, which was created the same way as I just told you. I've got a copy sub with 10 times copying a line <coughs> and doing the uh, flipping thing. And then this is copied, this one plane is copied 10 times in Z or Z. And this gives me the cube. And the cube I transformed into a texture. All these positions I transformed into a texture. And yeah, now it becomes funny because um, what I'm then doing, what we're doing in here is we're now taking uh, for each direction, for each axis that you're looking at the cube, we created 10 cameras. And each camera only has a very narrow near far clipping plane. And so each camera is just looking at a very small slice of space. And whenever a pixel flies through that little space, then this renderer recognizes that, oh, there's a pixel here, there's a pixel there. So you can see basically all these slices lighting up. So these are all slices in one axis direction. And those are then combined in a little with a little pixel shader, which is not a difficult pixel shader. It literally just takes all these, um, it takes all of these slices and basically says, oh, your slice 10, then this means, oh, you're looking at it. Anyway, it was fairly simple to build this. Um, and then all three directions are combined and converted again into uh, a chop channel, which is our DMX samples. And this feeds directly into the preview. Um, it's worthwhile looking at this whole thing just to see how maybe a volumetric display could work. I then <coughs> had the... Uh, you can also make this a little voxel preview by not having just LEDs, but uh, or basically replacing every LED with a little box and scaling the box by the luminance <coughs> of the uh, pixel, so you can kind of better tell what's going on there. Anyway, this uh, this file is available online. Um, you can just download it and play around with it. It has all the same. Um, principles of DMX that Ben just explained, plus the additional mapping uh, for volumetric, for fairly simple volumetric uh, shape. Um, I would like to point out one more thing which is really useful for, uh, for, um, no, I'm not going to point that out because it's, um, we do have a we do have a nice feature which is the uh, if you're if you're dealing with if you're dealing with uh, a cube thing then often 
maybe you want to have geometry that goes through there that you're animating, like some text or whatever, or a plane that's rotating, and you will find this in this file as well. But uh, sometimes maybe you don't want all of this uh, geometry. Sometimes you just want um, some nice uh, color animation going through here. And this would be where you can do um, uh, UV mappings as well. Like just think about uh, an LED cube with uh, where you assign different U and V values to each uh, plane. Sorry, that's uh, building that thing that I just showed you. But Here's, for example, an idea where you give every axis a different uh, ramp. And so if you want to have a scaling uh, sphere in your cube, you have to think about a scaling sphere as basically three circular ramps in each direction. So it's fairly simple to do it with that. Um, a very simple example is when you use noise, because noise takes a second input, and the second input into a noise top set to a 3D noise will be uh, uh, lookup points into the noise field. So you can actually supply the positions of your LEDs in the cube and put that into the second input of this noise top, and out comes the noise values at those precise positions in the noise field. So uh, feeding the noise field into, um, into a cube makes it look <coughs> like this, for example. So you have an animated noise. And all that is is literally taking the uh, LED positions, converting the uh, Color, uh, the LED positions from the sub into a chop and converting the chop into a top because we cannot go directly from sub to top idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have to do two steps and then feeding that into a noise top. You can, so it, it's fairly quick to create such effects here. Again, also this file is available online. Um, it has some more, uh, it has some more ideas, for example, using height maps to address LEDs or um, grouping for uh, having a plane, like you're rotating a plane through the uh, cube and you're creating groups and you're turning these groups on and off. Uh, so on a geometric level, solving this whole problem. And then it becomes a little bit esoteric with other things but they work as well. And whatever we did here. Oh yeah, event shop. Lots of ideas. <laughs> but we are definitely out of time, so. Um, um, we have those <coughs> published. It's a Dropbox right now, right? Yeah, it's Dropbox, I think. and it's on the Trust Center's uh, derivative workshop Slack. It's on the workshop Slack, which, uh, are we, did we give that out? But um, we should we're going to make a, um, a folder of all the files that we can get our hands on from all the presenters available to everyone that attended. And we'll send out the link to actually your email so you all get it. If you guys don't mind one more email from us, <laughs> we'll send one email with our Dropbox folder. And we're going to try to collect as many files from presenters as possible. Mm -hmm. um, because we understand not everybody can be at all the workshops. Or so uh, we'll, we'll send it out in the next week or so. Otherwise, you can check out um, this uh, GitHub. Um, um, <laughs> just remember that. <laughs> it's better than my Twitter handle, so. Um, and under, under collection, there is LED cube render. Um, so it's a Wüstenarchitekten, and they don't allow umlaut. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, anyway.
and then collection and there's the LED cube render in there and a couple other things that I keep finding on my hard drive so anyway uh, since the next thing already starts in 50 minutes uh, have a nice lunch and uh, bug us for questions <laughs>